it's great to have you all here tonight. Um, this is an amazing topic that we're all gathered here tonight to learn about. I'm so glad um, that you all came out. Um, there is, I don't think, anything as exciting as uh, prairie wildland conservation when it comes to the future of the Wilderness Act, much less conservation in, in this region in general. It's just a really fascinating topic, and we have three of the best people uh, here tonight to tell us all about uh, some of the past, present, and future of conservation on these amazing landscapes that we're so lucky to have so many of here in Montana. Um, I am Zach Porter. I work for the Montana Wilderness Association as the Next Gen Wilderness Leaders Program Director. That's an effort to get the 30 and under crowd, so a lot of us in this room here, um, outside, engaged with wild country and engaged with uh, what it takes to make sure that wild country stays wild. And if that's something that appeals to you, then I hope that before you leave tonight, you'll put your name down on a sign-up sheet that's on the table just outside the room here and join in with a whole bunch of amazing students in this room right now with a group called the University of Montana Wilderness Association. Can some of those folks raise their hand real quick in the room who are a part of that? There's a lot of you guys, I know. Um, so please, uh, please get involved. It's a lot of fun when you get out in places just like this. Um, the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act provides an opportunity to take a step back and reflect on where we've been and where we're going with wilderness. And that's what makes tonight's discussion um, so special. Um, when you look at a map of protected landscapes in the U.S. and in the world, where do you see them? Well. You probably see them more often in mountains and forests than you do in the types of places that we're going to see tonight. But why is that? Why? That's what we're going to dive into. And it doesn't have to be that way. And we can, we can make sure that these places are protected while making sure that uh, we continue to have thriving economies out in these landscapes as well. Um, so I want to just uh, introduce uh, our speakers and then get out of here so they can do their thing. Um, we're going to go through each of them. They'll each have about uh, 15 minutes to, to share their thoughts. Um, and then we'll save questions for the end. So if you've got a, a question that comes up right away, please write it down. Don't forget it. We'll spend plenty of time at the end um, chatting with, with, with everyone in the room about um, what, you're, what you're wondering about. So let me start with our first speaker of the night, Rick Potts. Someone I am very proud to call a friend and I was so thrilled to have here tonight. Rick is the manager of the uh, C.M. Russell, uh, Charlie M. Russell Wildlife Refuge in uh, Eastern Montana. It's a 1.1 million acre refuge, an amazing landscape. Um, Rick has had a really incredible career uh, working on behalf of our public lands in this country. Um, working uh, as, as, as from, from in the field to in Washington, D.C., um, Rick has served as the National Park Service uh, Wilderness Training Program Manager at the Carhartt Center right here in Missoula. He directed the National Wilderness and Recreation Programs for the Park Service in Washington, D.C. And he also served as Chief of the Conservation and Outdoor Recreation Division of the Park Service um, and later on was a key member of the team that produced the America's Great Outdoors Report that was submitted to President Obama uh, towards the beginning of uh, his uh, time in office, and which I hope some of you maybe were able to, to participate in here on campus uh, when the Great Outdoors folks uh, came here for a discussion several years back. Um, Rick is one of the nation's leading advocates for connecting young people with the outdoors as well. I want to make special note of that fact. That's something that I really admire about him. Again, we're, we're really lucky to have him here tonight. Thank you, Rick. Uh, yeah, no, I'm Hold on one second. I'm just going to let everybody know. That way we can just let okay. everybody keep talking. Good deal. Um, Hugo Turek, another very special person to have in, uh, in, in the room tonight. Hugo is, uh, a, 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 has farmed and ranched in Coffee Creek, Montana for 30 years. Uh, Coffee Creek is out in the island range country of uh, central and eastern Montana. Amazing country. Um, if you've never been there before, get yourself out that way. Uh, he and his family raise cattle and small grains, and he refers to himself as a, as a public land rancher, uh, someone who uses both private and public lands to, to graze his cattle. Uh, in 1995, at the request of, of 
several conservation organizations, Hugo agreed to put his name on a position on the Central Montana Resource Advisory Council. And these councils are comprised of people from all walks of life, from all interests. Um, and Hugo was amazed at the time that he was being asked as a rancher to participate on this uh, council on behalf of conservation organizations. But it's because Hugo has an incredible land ethic and a lot to teach all of us about uh, using our public lands in, in for multiple uses. And I think he'll share some really amazing insights into the values that he sees in our uh, public wildlands, especially on our, 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 our grasslands. Um, Hugo, uh, importantly, chaired that Resource Advisory Council during the hearings on the creation of what's now the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument, which happens to be, I think, my favorite wild place in Montana, a place that I visit ritually every May, beginning with my first trip that I took to the Wilderness and Civilization Program here five years ago, and just another amazing, amazing place. Um, so, yeah, we're really lucky to have Hugo here tonight. And finally, Cameron Sapp, uh, my coworker, works out of our uh, Montana Wilderness Association Billings office. It's our newest office, and it's the office that I am most excited about because of these amazing landscapes that he's, he's working to protect. Cameron is not only working in Billings, he's born and bred from Billings, went to college in Billings, loves these landscapes, has explored them all his life. Um, he graduated from Rocky Mountain College in 2012 uh, with degrees in environmental science and environmental management and policy. And he's now working to engage the public on protecting 700,000 acres of uh, wilderness deserving uh, public lands out in uh, that part of the state. Um, when he's not doing that, which he's doing a lot of the time though, Cameron is an avid birder. Uh, he loves snowshoeing and backpacking. And uh, again, we're really thrilled to have Cameron here tonight. So thank you guys, and let's dig in. Thanks. Thanks to uh, Natalie, Rachel, and Peter for hosting this series with the uh, Wilderness Institute. It's a great outfit, and this lecture series is uh, really exciting to be a part of. And thanks to Zach for coordinating and bringing us all together. And it, I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to take in any of the Big Sky Film Festival, but the Wild 50 uh, strand of, of wilderness-related films, just an exceptional lineup. So if you haven't had a chance to go see those, you really should because they'll give you just a wonderful background on what this whole wilderness idea is, is all about. And they're free. And they're free. And, and especially thanks to everyone in Missoula and across Montana who's involved in celebrating this 50th anniversary of the passage of, of the Wilderness Act. And, and to my agency as well, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, for supporting my participation in this event tonight. And I've got to tell those of you who maybe weren't involved in the 40th anniversary celebration, uh, it was a much more somber affair. We had a different administration in office back in Washington, D.C., and it was just at the time when I was leaving my ranch in the Bitterroot Valley and going back to Washington, D.C. to take over as the National Wilderness Program Director for the National Park Service. And we were essentially muzzled. The federal agencies were not allowed to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. The wilderness was a bad word. And I, I don't know exactly what the W stands for in the name of our former president, but I can damn sure assure you it was not wilderness. <laughs> I'm happy to say that the current administration gets it. They understand that wilderness is not a political agenda. It's not a red thing. It's not a blue thing. It's not a green thing. It's an American thing. Wilderness is red, white, and blue. And it's, it's for the, as the Wilderness Act says, for the permanent good of the whole people. And that's what wilderness in this country is all about. <coughs> Our journey, if those of us who are not Native Americans, but those of us who colonized this country from Europe or Africa or, or, Asian, or the Asian continent, our journey on this wilderness adventure really started here about 209 years ago, this coming April, when the Lewis and Clark expedition hit the confluence of the Missouri River and the Yellowstone River and entered into what is now 
Montana. And right about that time, you will note in the Lewis and Clark journals that his description of the scenery and the wildlife and the just awe-inspiring landscape that they were crossing over gets very rich, very eloquent. And he talks about having to wait for hours while herds of buffalo pass in front of them and elk and deer and uses words you see over and over again, many wolves, many elk, many bighorn sheep, lots of this, lots of that. It was just literally like a, a Serengeti experience and really the first epic wilderness adventure of, uh, in this country. And they passed through a lot of the land that is now the Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge, the UL Bend National Wildlife Refuge, which is designated wilderness. And they passed through the areas that are now there. We have 15 additional proposed wilderness areas on the CMR refuge that were recommended by the President of the United States and sent over to Congress for their consideration 40 years ago. Congress hasn't acted yet, but they're still there. They're still on the table and they're being protected to preserve all of their wilderness character and their wilderness values so that when Congress does get around to designating them, they will still be very high quality wilderness areas for you all to enjoy. Meriwether Lewis wrote, going, through, going up the Missouri River and through the Missouri River breaks, that I am, I am gazing upon scenes of visionary enchantment. And it's so true. Those of you, how many people, folks have had the opportunity to spend time out in the Missouri breaks and the, and the prairie, prairie country? Okay, so a lot of you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. It's a very difficult place to describe because it is much different from the high country snow and ice that many of us take as kind of the, the standard for wilderness. Thinking about prairie and the breaks as wilderness is really a, um, an acquired taste, I think you might say, and, and, and something that you really have to experience to get. I know in that wilderness ex, you know, adventure that Lewis and Clark and the core of Discovery went on, there was a, a participant by the name of John Potts who was, who was there with that group. And I don't know if I'm direct kin to John Potts or not, but I can tell you what, when I'm in that area and when I retrace the steps that they, that they traced 209 years ago, I can feel that connection. Wilderness to me is a living legacy on that landscape of the adventures. It's really, it personifies who we are as a culture in this country. Wallace Stegner described the wilderness landscape as the anvil upon which the American character has been forged. That character he defined as rugged, one of rugged individualism that defines the American character. That's the wilderness landscape Lewis and Clark crossed. And the prairies continue to provide that opportunity. They're so vast and so big and that you feel so small and yet very much alive in a part of that landscape that it's so difficult to, to describe. How many of you are students in the wilderness program now. Okay, quite a few. So I'm sure a lot of you have, have read Rod Nash, Wilderness in the American Mind, right? Because Rod Nash makes a very good argument of what came first, wilderness or civilization. And, and his answer is, for us anyway, in the context of the Wilderness Act, civilization came first because it wasn't until we had built cities that we could look out of that we could appreciate these lands that were set aside, that the Wilderness Act says were mad as a visitor who does not remain. And wilderness then is an invention of the American mind, of the people, by the people, for the people, highly democratic in concept, and that it's open to everyone to come and enjoy. The Wilderness Act contains, for a piece of federal legislation, which are generally pretty sterile, written by a room full of lawyers, the Wilderness Act contains just some amazingly beautiful language. They, the opening says, in order to assure that an increasing population, accompanied by expanding settlement and growing mechanization, does not occupy and modify all areas within the United States, leaving no lands designated for preservation 
and protection in their natural condition. It is hereby declared to be the policy of the Congress to secure for the American people of present and future generations the benefits of an enduring resource of wilderness. The benefits of an enduring resource of wilderness. And then it goes on to define wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his works dominate the landscape is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man. Untrammeled, an unusual word. I've known some folks, including some wilderness managers, who thought it said untrampled. I heard a wilderness manager say to me one time, this campsite is really trammeled. I mean, it's really trammeled. Now, what's a trammel? A trammel is a net or a trap. It's something that impedes the free flow, the free way of going of an ecosystem and its processes. A fish net trammels a fish's ability to swim up a river. Hobbles on a horse trammel the ability of a horse to move freely. And man and his imprint trammels a lot of the landscape of this country. And the Wilderness Act says these are areas that should be untrammeled, allowed to be wild and free. Who came up with this word? Who wrote this word? A gentleman by the name of Howard Zonizer was the principal author of the Wilderness Act. And Howard Zonizer was, uh, Howard Zonizer was a really cool guy. He was, he was schooled in the way of legislation, but he was also a poet at heart and the son of a, a preacher. He was a minister's son. And so he had this kind of a religious zeal. To him, wilderness was a pretty a sacred place. And so the language he used in the Wilderness Act really reflects those values. I never got to know Howard Zonizer, but I knew his son, Ed. I know his son, Ed, really well. He, Ed inherited Howard's gift for words and spent a long career with the National Park Service as a writer and editor translating science into song, science into art, telling the story about our, about our natural world in a way that people can understand. He tells the stories, you know, Howard, the son of a preacher, used to take his kids for walks in the wilderness in the Adirondacks in New York when they were, when they were growing up. And being the son of a minister, he would lead the family in hymns. They would be hiking down the trail singing hymns. And when the kids were really young, they had this one hymn that they were particularly fond of, and they really belted it out whenever it came up, and it was, it was gladly the cross I'd bear. And Howard didn't quite know why the kids thought this was such a cool hymn until years later when they got to talking about it. Well, it turned out when the kids were singing gladly the cross I'd bear, they thought they were singing about a bear named Gladly who had vision issues. <laughs> gladly the cross I'd bear. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. The Wilderness Act goes on to say that these wilderness areas shall be devoted to six public purposes. And I know you wilderness students could recite them all with me. Recreational, scenic, scientific, conservation, education, and historical use. And of those six, at least three scientific, conservation, and educational are directly aimed at, at recognizing and protecting the ecological values of wilderness. So wilderness is a, is the Wilderness Act is at the same time a recreation act, a social well-being act, and an ecological conservation act, all wrapped up into one brilliant piece of legislation as a way of applying a prescription on the landscape for the whole good, the permanent good of the whole people. And for me as an ecologist, that's particularly important because wilderness areas, when they were selected, should represent the best of what's left of every single ecosystem type in the country. So every, every biome, every ecoregion, every ecosystem type should have its own units included in the National Wilderness Preservation System. And that's particularly true of places like prairies that are so complex and yet so vestigial in what's left of, the, of them, of the intact prairies. It's critical, I believe, to get prairies included 
in a much greater degree in the National Wilderness Preservation System. These areas then, because they're the best of what's left and are the least manipulated by human development and man's imprint, should serve then as the benchmarks or the gold standards that we would strive for as ecologists to maintain an ecosystem and manage an ecosystem, and in some cases restore an ecosystem that's been devastated. And similarly then, they should serve as the control plots, if you will, to help us understand and interpret the effects of everything else we're doing as a human species on the rest of the landscape across this, this nation. So wilderness areas have a critical value from an ecological standpoint that really helps us as biologists and ecologists and the general public understand the effects of habitat fragmentation, understand the effects of disruption of wildlife corridors and loss of breeding grounds or winter grounds or migration habitats, understand the results of climate change, understand the results of air pollution and water pollution so that we can more effectively articulate the impacts and more effectively deal with them and, and apply solutions. How many here are wilderness users, wilderness practitioners? How many of you, yeah, you're kind of the choir. <laughs> and Missoula's kind of, of course, been the nerve center, one of the original nerve centers and it remains so for wilderness advocacy and wilderness use and wilderness appreciation. So I get it that you all love wilderness. And there's about 6%, you are members of about 6% of the United States population who will actually go into wilderness and lay your sleeping bag out on the ground and sleep under the stars. The first thing you learn when you go back to Washington DC and you participate in our democratic form of government is that for anything to be sustained, you've got to have 50% plus one of the voting population to care about something. 6% isn't going to cut it. So it's not good enough. It's not good enough for you to love wilderness, to go into wilderness, to use wilderness, to enjoy wilderness. That's not going to keep the National Wilderness Preservation System sustained for the next 50 years. You have got to become the champions for wilderness. You have got to be the breeder reactors. Missoula, Montana has got to be a breeder reactor to generate new wilderness advocates. And you've got to do that by engaging your peers. The great Ian Player told us a group of wilderness managers were together at the World Wilderness Congress up in Alaska about a decade ago. And he worked to get a lot of the wilderness areas in South Africa designated working with the Zulu people. And he said, it's not good enough to talk among your, your colleagues. You have got to gather people around your campfire <coughs> Find your voices, tell your stories, share your passions, and bring others along with you. Because that's the way that wilderness preservation system is going to be sustained. It's our job to pass on these enduring benefits of resource to the next generation, even as they have been passed on to us. The people who came before us for the last 50 years have done Herculean effort in building the National Wilderness Preservation System we have today. Your job is going to be actually tougher because the rocks and ice, in many ways, were the low-hanging fruit for inclusion into the Wilderness Preservation System. The lands that are left that you might want to include now have other social values. They've got oil and gas under them. They've got precious minerals. They've got value in, in resource commodity production. And it's going to be tougher to convince your to convince society to protect them in perpetuity. But that's your job, that's your role. Montana prairies would be a good place to start. We've got 15 proposed wilderness areas setting in the CMR National Wildlife Refuge just waiting for designation. What better year to get them designated than the 50th anniversary of the National Wilderness Act. Thank you. Uh, my apologies. I, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up. I'm here to prove that age is not necessarily wisdom. <laughs> and uh, 
I think I'll be a shining example of that. Uh, I always like to start out I always like to start out by explaining that I'm a simple farmer and rancher. I spend more time talking to cows than I do people. Uh, I think they understand me better too than people do. Um, we make our, what's interesting is all three of us here tonight make our living off the prairies in different ways. He's protecting them, promoting them, and of course my family and I we make a living off of them. We raise cattle, we raise small grains. And so tonight I just want to share with you, you know, my prairies and how I look at them and also point out that they've been inhabited an extremely long time by man, temporarily by Indians who were almost permanent on them. They came to the same campgrounds every year. But from the homestead period on, for the last 150 years, we have been there. And we have done a lot of damage. And some of us now are trying to do some good, and I can share that with you. Uh, when I talk about the prairie, I talk about sky. To me, the most important thing about the prairie is the sky. It writes continually on the landscape. And so when you live on the prairie, you live in a process, and a process of complete change. And this just particular photograph, you can see that storm rolling in. And it brings me back to think of Philip Auberg, the pianist from Chester, Montana. Maybe some of you heard him perform. He performed for the Montana Wilderness Association a number of years ago. And, they, and that was before MWA got involved in the uh, prairies. They were totally mountain oriented. And so they asked him to perform for a half hour to a slideshow. And I introduced a speaker from Montana State University, Greg Keeler, who grew up on the Nebraska prairies and is a poet down there and a dear friend of mine. And so I talked and had a lot of fun about prairies and I introduced him. Well, at the end of the program, Philip Auberg came over to me and said, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, that was the hardest program I've ever performed. I have never done anything like that. And I said, why? He says, mountains, nothing but goddamn mountains. <laughs> How do you perform a crescendo to a mountain? And I walked home, and I think about it. And I look at this right here with this storm building. Yeah, I could do a crescendo. You do it, it's this change because it's process. And that's exactly what Philip Auberg saw, is process. <laughs> oh, here we go. Now we'll see if it keeps working. I'm, these are, these photographs represent the views that we almost share of the prairie. That's what we see. Okay, this is Cow Island, if I recall, down in the Missouri Breaks National Monument, a place with you see lots of form, a lot of structure, not a lot of sky in this photograph. Another shot. I'm just going to go through these fast. Once again, How come I'm not getting this to work? You can just point at me and I'll advance. <laughs> okay, go ahead. These are all shots of the Upper Missouri Breaks National Monument. And for most of us, that's our view of the prairies. <clears throat> we float the Missouri River Breaks in the year. We go down the rivers and we look at the prairies from that boat. My experience is completely different. It live on a landscape. Next. A landscape, like I said, that's been inhabited and then, of course, abandoned over and over again. This is a homestead near our place that's been abandoned. And, of course, now this is our place. And when people abandon the homesteads, they left the machinery there very often. Sometimes almost still hooked up, as that is to a plow, and just walked off. I know of cases where people, we have one place, in fact, the first photo was a place we call the King Place. Our place is made up of old homesteads. And so when we go out, we talk about where we're at by homesteads. We knew none of those people, but they existed. This one person was a carpenter. He left in the middle of the night, 
left all of his tools there. Nobody knows where he went. This is characteristic of leaving the prairies, a place where people built dreams, came out to build communities, to create families, and then left, and left a lot of their life there. Go ahead. And they left garbage behind. But some of this garbage is quite interesting, and this is on our place. That is a ripper. And if you look to this end of the ripper, that's where it hooked to the horse. And off this end here, there were a couple big handles like that. That thing has to weigh 200 pounds. And somehow, somebody stood that upright and walked behind a team of horses pulling that. And there it was now just an abandoned piece of garbage. Go ahead. They left their homes. They left their stoves. This is up on a place where a person, another one of our homesteads on the place. Go ahead. And if you look at this carefully, this is what characterizes so much of my landscape, just across my place, but across all the breaks. This is a dump. Look up there. You can see the material hanging, coming off the side. You can look and see an old car. And the whole break's edges on those prairies are loaded with old dumps. For my wife, they're treasure boxes at times uh, for old bottles and everything. OK, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, I'm going to switch for a minute because I want to talk about people who lived out there. And this is my grandparents. And they're on the Dakota Prairies, and he's breaking sod. And a couple things about this is interesting because I'm going to show you about five or six photographs here very quickly. This is what I call the, the Frederick Remington approach to the prairies. When Frederick Remington painted the cowboy, he was the dominant person on that prairie. The prairie sort of sank away, hid from him. And that cowboy on the horse bucking or whatever it is there. This is true here or here. My grandfathers and uncles, they were the dominant things conquering a prairie, in a sense, trying to rule it. The thing that's interesting about this photograph is really fascinating to me is the corn that they're cultivating is all bent over in the wind. Look at it. And yet there's no wind that day, which means it's been beaten so long, that's the way it's going to grow. <laughs> okay, He went to Canada. He came from Poland. He left his wife and son in Anamoose, North Dakota on, on the farm, went up with his brothers and homesteaded in Canada with the idea that he could at least move back to a humid, to a mountainous area, something away from these godforsaken prairies. And it failed. He came home, and he made his peace with the prairies. And this photograph is the beginning of a change in how he looked at the world as I see it. You see here, he's now living much more, not in the world of the vertical, but in the world of the horizontal. The prairie it might not be back there. But you look at him with that old Johnny Putt engine there, and everything goes parallel to the ground. You see it now with the children. You might have a few trees, but the children are starting to come into the landscape, and the landscape and the sky is taking much more predominance. Here the children are down in the landscape. Here they are now sitting, looking out on that prairie where that old Johnny Putt engine now is sitting, looking the other way, and the kids are down inside the landscape. And the sky and the landscape becomes almost a dominant figure. And finally, the children are lost in the photograph. They're down in the very bottom here in the center. You know, his view of the prairies completely changed. And it changed by giving into the prairies and letting them, in some sense, rule him. In some sense, becoming a part instead of trying to any longer dominate it. And of course, this is just an old prairie schooners. We were leaving North Dakota. My wife took that years ago. Taking you back to my country, where I live, and like they pointed out, I live in central Montana, where Square Butte and Round Butte are there, and of course, the breaks, and this is on our land. But this is my preference of looking at the prairies, which is just simply sky and land. 
with sky and land that is continually changing. Look at that. This is a nice fall scene, early winter. You can see the snow, but look at the colors. Same set in the background. I've kept the mountain in to keep everybody happy because I'm in mountain country. <laughs> but once again, take a look at the change in the landscape changed by the season. And let me assure you, on cold days, it does look like that out there. It's that blue and that cold, especially when the wind blows. Another scene, and the same thing, but just a little different time of the day, different shadows. Always now, the land and the sky continually changing. Go ahead. Once you learn to accept that, then you begin to look down. You no longer, you know, you're always constantly looking at the sky and the land. In fact, I always said my father, who got blown off the Dakota prairies, never really left them. But he always walked with one eye to the sky and one eye on the ground. He was always, in some sense, the dirt farmer. So now you begin to look at what's out there. And you find it in tiny amounts sometimes. Look at that little, on that fragmented piece of ground. On the other hand, there is this lush richness. And Rick mentioned the complexity of the prairies. Prairie grasslands are so much more complex than forest lands. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> they are very complex. When you take a look at forbs and grasses out there, and our cattle are totally dependent on. One of the things that we found is that the native grasses where we run our cattle, and most of our land is what we run our cattle is our BLM land, and it's all native, do much better than they do on domestic grasses. Go ahead. Just another shot of the prairie from our you know, land. One more. Then I wanted to take you down into an equal, in, into on bottom of Arrow Creek down there and an aquifer and a landscape down there that my wife and I started to change and work towards. And if you look at these, all these trees have been cut by beaver. Go ahead. And here you can see where they were cut. And my mother-in-law, when she first came out there and they lived all those years, those damn beaver were not going to destroy her trees. <laughs> by God, those trees were going to be saved. And we bought it. We agreed. And so we, you know, struggled with it. My mother-in-law trapped them. A few of our cows got caught in the traps, more than one. But then we began to raise some questions. And when my mother-in-law could no longer go out there, Judy and I said, let's look at this and let's think of this a little different. What happens if we don't trap the beavers? What's going to emerge out here on this Badlands Crick? And this is a prairie crick. It's really Badlands. It gets flash floods on it that we'll come back to. And if you look at these, on just a couple points, you can see right here, this first tree, it looks like two trees coming together. Over another one where two trees are coming together, you can just see all these trees coming like this. Those are all old beaver cuts. Those trees were always had been cut as single and when they came back they came back as two and sometimes three and the whole place is full of nothing but that go ahead these are the trees we're talking about these are the old ones these are our forests we think they're much more beautiful than pine <laughs> and here's what we left we left there's a beaver out there swimming you can see the dam you can see now we have willows here. Another shot, little dam down there and this. And then just one more shot. Go ahead. This now is what that system looks like. If you look at it carefully, there's every age of cottonwood out there. There's all these willows. And you see this huge process starting to take place in which these willows have now taken over, the cottonwoods are going to come in, take over from the willows, and you begin this whole process over again. And so now you have a really healthy system 
in which it becomes a hell of a lot harder to get our cows out. <laughs> my wife was down there with my daughter, and she was on one side, and my daughter was on the other side, and they were trying to get the cows out. <clears throat> and uh, Judy said, what? my daughter yelled to my wife and said, Mom, you know, I can't get this cow out. And Judy yelled back, she says, that's because it's an elk. <laughs> because we never had elk down there till this happened. Because this changed everything. The water now stays basically flowing year round. It provides shelter for them. And it provides the cows a really good place to hide, get away from mosquitoes, and so on. Go ahead. But a lot of these old trees, and I'm going to bring you to one because it's one of our favorites, have survived. And they survived now not because they're on the water, but because they had enough root system, they've survived above the water. And this old gnarled tree is probably one of the oldest ones on the place. And if you look carefully, you can see where the, it drops off down to the water over there. Go ahead. Here's that same shot of that tree. You can see how gnarled it is, how beat up it is. This is an early spring shot. It is, not, it is dying, but it's been dying for the 30 years that I have been there. <laughs> Let me assure you, it's been dying for that long. <laughs> Give me another shot. So I, you know, I told my wife, I said, you know, look at this. Look at how gnarled this is. Look at the character in this. You don't get character like that in pine trees. <laughs> it takes getting beat up in the wind and the hailstones and everything else to get, you know, that kind of character. <laughs> Go ahead, one more. <laughs> so I do want to give you two quick shots. Once again, this old tree had been beaver cut. See? One more shot. And even though it's dying, there's a calf there taking shelter with it. OK, go ahead. Go ahead. These are just prairie shots I want to take on our, of our landscape. And I want to tr spend a couple minutes very quickly on what happens with water. Once again, a shot of just a storm coming in. Go ahead. Another shot of that storm. And these storms come in, and we don't know how big they're going to get. They can just explode, as they very often do. This one, I think, afterwards, we went down to the brakes real quick to see what happened. There was a lightning strike. You can see the smoke. Go ahead. This was after one of the storms, and all the stuff is coming through the fields, and this sump back there. A vernal pond is suddenly filling with water. Eight to 10 hours later, even if that's been dry for 10 years, it'll be full of chorus frogs and spadefoot toads and you can hardly hear. Another one just north of our house. This one's a little been around a while. And this is one that's over by my son's. These are just literally vernal ponds that after a big rainstorm came in. And within hours, the birds come in. And those are wheat fields, by the way. You can see where this has been. It used to be wheat before it drowned it out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here they are again. Look at what's there. Gottlibs, curlews, Franklin gulls. Go ahead. American avocets. In fact, that's a family that nested there. And you can see. Go ahead. Feeding. Go ahead. Oh, just one quick. I, this was not supposed to be in here. It got in here. Uh, remember that scene. That's Bitter Creek, up by Glasgow. 60,000 acres of pure wilderness that definitely needs to be protected. Okay, go ahead. Another great shot. <laughs> Another great shot. Now, and see, we cultivate our land, but still, look what it does, even under cultivation. It's our land basically runs between cultivation and complete wilderness. Go ahead. And this shot I like because simply what to your left over there is where that pond was. It's dried up. And this is the wheat that didn't get drowned out, and we're now cutting it. And here is a bucket full of spadefoot and chorus frogs and spadefoot toads, and this is what everything was eating out there. OK, just very quickly. Uh, that's a, a prairie toad that my daughter, uh, go back. Can, we, can you back up real quick? You can see it right in here in the middle. And they wander across the prairies. They take long treks. But my granddaughter, go ahead, had to pick it up and bring it in. 
And of course, go ahead. We took it back out and put it back out there so it could continue its journey. Uh, this is an arrested development of a salamander. These literally will stay in that stage forever. And that's part of it out there. Go ahead. Just once again, a couple really quick shots of sky, of landscape, and of a land that we have lived on out there for hundreds of years that maintains all these wild characteristics. And how do we continue to do that? That's the question. Go ahead. Prairie yucca. One of my favorite quick story about that. We had three feet of snow one winter. We went out and hired somebody to fly us to find the cows. Rick and I were talking about helping. We found them. We had to snowshoe in, lead horses in to break and get them out. There was no roses bush left, and there was no yucca. These cows had learned to reach down, and because these things are really sharp. They're like thorns. And reach down, pull it out by the bottom, and eat it that way in. Go ahead. One more. Uh, showy milkweed, a native in the country, basically now survives along road edges. They spray it out, think it's a noxious weed. It's not. It's uh, which the uh, painted lady butterflies survive on and migrate on. Go ahead. Uh, I raise cows. Sometimes they get stuck in my house uh, for a short period of time. This one, unfortunately, was quite short. It died. Go ahead. I just had to show you a couple winter scenes. Go ahead. We'll just roll through them. My daughter-in-law. <laughs> Go ahead. One more. My wife's, of course, burrowing owls. Just a quick shot of some animals. Now, these are the last three shots. And I happen to like cows. Uh, I'm quite happy with them. And uh, I like to see them on the landscape. Go ahead. Go ahead, one more. And there they are out there in the prairie. I'd be okay if it's buffalo, but I'm happy with cows. And I think they do the same thing, pretty much. But if you took the cows off of that landscape, go ahead, I would still have this. Or I would still have. Go ahead, this. And that is basically what keeps us out there. I thank you. Well, my name is Cameron, and can everyone hear me? Good. Well, I am the Prairie Wildlands Coordinator for the Montana Wilderness Association, and thank you all for coming, and thank you for having me. It's an awesome pleasure to be here. Uh, this is kind of an unusual crowd for me. I'm not used to seeing Patagonia and Columbia. It's usually a Carhartt shirt, a Wrangler pants, and a tattered pair of Tony Lama boots. So <laughs> this is this is un unusual, but I, I appreciate it nonetheless. Okay, we're just gonna wait a second. Let me get this up. There we go. All right, so my pictures are probably not as cool as Hugo's, but these are pretty special. These are all pictures that were taken in Montana as well. I took a lot of them myself. Next one. All right, so why the prairie? This is, a, this is kind of a weird question. I get pretty blank stares often not, or more often than not when I tell people that I'm fighting for wilderness in eastern Montana. They're just, why? <laughs> get a lot of whys or like what, what's left of there. And I think that we're approaching the subject all wrong when it comes to prairie wilderness. We try to justify this landscape by how we can recreate on it. We think, how can we, where can we go hiking on it? Where can I go fishing on it? But we don't think about the other aspects of it. Because Walt, Walt Stegner gets it. He, uh, he's quoted a lot in wilderness ide ideology. Walt, Walt Stegner actually spent the time of his life in Great Falls, Montana. So he was formed by the prairie. He spent his young years there, so he knows it. He gets it. And he says that save a piece of country like that intact, and it does not matter in the slightest that only a few people every year will go into it. That is precisely its value. Roads would be a desecration. Crowds would ruin it. But those who haven't the strength or youth to go into it and live can simply sit and look. 
like I said, we're trying to justify it by how we can recreate on it. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are amazing hunting opportunities on the prairie. There's awesome hiking. There's incredible wildlife. There's horseback riding. But there, there's a prairie. The prairie does something else to you that I think we can't explain. I have a hard time explaining it myself, but Rick said it well. It's something that you, when you're out there, you can feel it. You, it's not something necessarily that you can see, and although, albeit that you can absolutely see it, but it's also something that you can feel. You feel the footsteps of people that have gone before you. You feel their hardships, their struggles, their trials, their successes as well. You see all the beauty in it. It's a place where the horizons are wider than the mountains are tall, and it's a very special landscape to myself. I admit I'm one of those people who, uh, <laughs> until college, I actually just, if I had to drive to Mile City or Eastern Montana, I was like, oh man, here we go again. It's just the same boring landscape. Just put your head down, drive, and hope it ends. And <laughs> one time, I, and finally, in my one of my classes at Rocky, we went out to the American Prairie Reserve and the C.M. Uh, Russell Wildlife Refuge, and we were doing research with black-footed ferrets and taking down fences on uh, prairie dog towns. And in that week that I spent out on the prairie doing all kinds of research, we were counting sage, uh, sage grouse on Lex, just uh, spotlighting for ferrets at night. I began to understand the depth in the, in the complexity of this world that I had thought was so boring and so desolate and it had nothing to offer and all of a sudden I became just in just intrigued by it and uh, I just uh, now I'm the prairie wildlands coordinator I have my special places in the mountains but I also now have my special places on the prairie and I, as someone who's grown up in East in Billings Montana that's a it's great to be able to be an hour away from the most beautiful prairies you've ever seen and an hour away from the most beautiful mountains that you'll ever see next one so we have to define where the prairie is uh, in order to really understand it and the great uh, we are basically the northern Great Plains uh, we are can be divided into two regions and it's the northern and it's basically the Missouri Plateau and the Northwest Glaciate Plains and the more time that you spend in these areas the more you start to understand about them if you see up here these are called the glaciated plains and if you've ever been out there have you ever heard, how many of you have ever heard of the prairie pothole region well that's what that is right there and that's what's referred to pretty often as the duck factory of the West <laughs> because that's where thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of ducks go to migrate every year. And then we have the Missouri Plateau. We have these high, lifted up, beautiful plateaus and flat uh, Great Plains with rolling hills that makes up that part of the state. Go to the next one. So what are the threats to the prairie? Uh, we have this landscape that to so many people appears so desolate that what's the big deal? Why should we care? What's happening to this part of our state? A lot of people don't understand it because they think it's just this boring, monotonous landscape, but there's really a lot of threats going on to it that we just tend to not pay attention to. The prairie is actually considered one of the most altered ecoregions in the entire world. It's, uh, it's very susceptible to change at the hand of man. It's easy, it, it appears easy to conquer, but it's not. Um, one of the, uh, in this, this, this place is shaped by change. The prairies are shaped by change. And that's and it's not this static location. We've got frigid winters, high winds, uh, seasonal migrations of a historical, historically millions of bison rampaging through, and now cattle uh, carrying out that same role. Blistering summers, intense spring rainstorms, and dry lightning outbreaks, racing rivers, and racing wildfires. In fact, the, the time that I went out there, with my class, um, it, it's such a, I'm actually more afraid of getting lost on the prairie. We were discussing this at, at dinner tonight. I am horrified of getting lost or stuck on the prairie. I, I, could, I can survive in the mountains, no problem, but I'm very afraid of the prairie. Um, we were just finishing our last day out on the prairie, and we saw all of a sudden, one of the scary things is you can see for miles, and so that also means that you can see those giant, just how big the storm clouds are, and just how fast they're coming in. And we saw this massive cloud coming in, and we ended up breaking the suspension in our van and our SUV, uh, trying to get out fast enough. <laughs> Because once those roads get wet, you are stuck. And you can get, if you try to wander out, you could go in circles for hours and you never even know it. It's that intense. But it, it's, it is a hard, intent, I want to say though, this is a hard and intense landscape, but it's a rewarding landscape as well. When you do have a successful and fun trip out there, 
you, you remember every detail of it, and it's a very it's something it's something that's very easy to treasure. Uh, significant grass, back to the threats, uh, significant grassland conversion is a major problem. What you're seeing right here is what's called sod busting. If you're going to grow crops in eastern Montana, you don't want to have sagebrush. And that's a major, uh, a major obstacle to a lot of people. So they'll go through, take these big chains. Well, they used to do chains, but now they have these big things right here now. So they just drag them through, rip it out, and it's all of a sudden this monoculture landscape it's, it's not very similar to what it was, uh, what its climax vegetation might represent. And it becomes farmland. And it's very difficult to restore. It's not impossible, but it is difficult to restore it. Uh, energy development is difficult, too. We have oil and gas tax holidays in and in, in around the Bakken region. So developers can come in and not pay taxes on their oil and gas developments for the first 18 months and then uh, pull out. And so we have those things going on. Uh, and then we also have habitat fragmentation due to the mass amounts of roads. In my discussions with the BLM staff in, in uh, Miles City, they estimate that there's upwards of 10,000 miles of roads in one portion of eastern, in about a third of eastern Montana alone. Not all of them are maintained or used, but there's a lot of habitat fragmentation going on because of that. There's invasive species and we have excessive fencing. There's historical migrations of, you want to go back one to the, map. We have historical migra migrations of antelope that go from here up to the Canadian grasslands and because we have such excessive fencing we tend to fence out our neighbors and, and there's a fence in, fence out, but we try to keep each other separate and, uh, and it's no longer allowing these wildlife to go to take their natural pathways. This is a long way to go from here and these antelope here run 60 miles an hour all the way up there and now they can't very easily because there's so much fencing going on. And fencing has its right and its role as well. It's, it is important. Next one. So I guess I'm going to start uh, kind of moving towards what do we have and what does our future look like for the prairie. Uh, like we discussed earlier, the UL Bend, that's the UL Bend wilderness right there. You'll notice that almost all of it's right here. As a whole organization, we're trying to change that. But we're also trying to change that picture out here. Because between these two little dots, you're looking at 32,000 acres. And the B Bob Marshall alone is substantially bigger than that, as all of you know. Are we going to the next one? But Montana is known, we have a lot of public lands. There are other states in the country that have hardly any public lands. But as a, as a state, we have a very vast amount. And you'll see that the western portion of the state is mostly made up of national forests. But eastern Montana is mostly made up of BLM. Land. I bet that I, very, I bet that a very few of you have actually gone out <laughs> and spent a day hiking BLM land. That's because most of it's over here. But there is a lot of it. Don't let me fool. You. Don't let it fool you. This is all around the CM Russell Wildlife Refuge right here. That's where this is. And there's lots of BLM land all up here and all around here. And we work on public lands as an organization. Um, let me go here. Okay. Go to the next one. So what do we have to work with? These are areas that I've gone through and identified uh, by myself and with the government as areas that have potential for prairie wilderness. Uh, what you're looking at is close to 700,000 acres of land of intact wilderness, or not, uh, mostly intact prairie wilderness that, deserves, that we feel deserves protection and that still represents those last best places as a state. Uh, our goal, Naturally, not all of these will qualify, um, and, and I, I realize that a lot of these are spread out in size, or spread out in location, but there are major blocks around here and here, and down here is some of the most beautiful country you'll see as well. <coughs> in fact, I got, we got, uh, we, we were, I was taking a look at this area with some students from Rocky Mountain College for a wilderness inventory, and in one week we got their record annual amount of rainfall in that area. That's uh, in that area alone. So I got stuck out in the middle of 50 miles from a town of 300 <laughs> and for quite a few days because of that. It's pretty, it's pretty intense place. So a tough day at the office for me might be getting stuck out in the prairie. So boo-hoo. <laughs> so what's next? Next one. So basically, we get we as an organization and the public are encouraged to be involved with how our public 
lands are managed. And this can be through the NEPA process, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, and the Resource Management Plan process, which, or, which is the RMPs that we're seeing. Um, and so we've been working with the BLM as they redo their RMPs to fight for the protection of our special prairie, special prairie wildlands. And, and, and these days, collaboration is the name of the game. I have to involve, and it's only right as a Montanan, as a person, as a stakeholder, as an organization, that we involve people like Hugo, who live off the land, Rick, who manages the land, and me, who recreates on the land. We have to involve everyone. It's only fair. Some, sometimes we get this mentality that, oh, it's our way or the highway when it comes to conservation. But we forget that there's other people who live there and work there. We're not just the ones who visit there. It doesn't give us a special right. Everyone needs to win on this. And it's not impossible. I promise you that. And that means business owners, farmers, ranchers, agencies, other organizations. And when we work through, sit down and we work through these issues together, I promise you, you find out that you have way more common ground than you ever thought. These people treasure these landscapes. That's why they live and work there. It's not, it's not that they don't agree with you on everything, I promise you. That we need to, if you we're gonna ever have a successful long-term prairie conservation network, we have to be willing to work with these people and sit at the same table and look eye to eye to them. Um, and so connecting people to places is key as well. I bet that a lot of these places are very foreign landscapes. There's very few signs. I have to use my GPS and my map very frequently. But that's what also what makes them so special is I feel like I've, I'm exploring this landscape that hardly anybody else except the surrounding landowners might know. Uh, the prairie is not a, it's such a desolate, it's such a quiet place. You might, every time I go hiking on the mountains, you might see six or seven different groups of people hiking on the same trail. When I've gone hiking, when I went hiking here, I didn't see another person. <laughs> And I was there for eight hours probably, and I didn't see a single other person. And that's what was so, <laughs> that was so great about it. Um, and so it's important. And how can, I call, how can we call and engage other people to fight for the protection of these places if they don't have a personal connection to them? Think of your favorite place. Uh, it could be a mountain. It could be a prairie, anything like that. OK, now imagine that something was imminently threatening it and the, and the integrity of it, the beauty of it, the scenic uh, ability of it. Imagine what you would do to fight for it. And how can I ask you to do that? Er, er, no, I promise that you visited one of those places. You don't have a favorite place that you've never been to. <laughs> it's such a simple statement, but you don't have a favorite place that you've never been to. And you can't fight for it, truly fight for it, if you don't, have your, uh, don't know what it means to you. So I'd encourage each of you to try to, make, try to get out to one of these places. I have a whole wealth of knowledge of how to get out to these places. And so if you want to know, ask me, or ask any of these guys. They have, I'm sure they have great places that, to tell you to go and find and make special on your own. It's important that I help you do that as part of my job and as part of me supporting the prairies, is that I help you define what the prairies mean to you. And so celebrating our heritage is also important. We're not trying to kick people off the land. We're trying to keep it, we have, our organization has these st stickers everywhere that say keep it wild. That simply means keeping it like it is. We're not changing anything, we're keeping the status quo. We're celebrating our heritage, we're celebrating the farmers and ranchers that live on this land and the state. Here's how you go find it and learn about it and, and so you can understand it. And legislation, um, like Rick was saying, I, I don't know where that will lead at this point because I've only been on the job for nine months and we're not there yet, but I'll tell you when we do. And I, I hope to see that point in my career with the MWA as well. But I couldn't say that I've done my, done my job well if I couldn't provide a permanent protection to these places like this. Like this is a beautiful place, Frenchman Creek. I couldn't say that I've done my job well if I haven't made permanent protection so that my kids can enjoy this like I've enjoyed it. And so I hope to eventually get to that point as well. And a prairie wilderness would be the first of its kind, too. Like, it, like it, we've been mentioning before, the, the rocks and the mountains and the ice was low-hanging fruit, and now it's time to fight for our heritage. We as Montanans are a state that's built on the prairie, actually. In large part, we came to the prairies first, and that's where we started. And so it's time to fight for that heritage, and uh, it's a pretty special landscape. So next one. So thank you for listening.
for the for the question and answer portion, we're going to do something a little different in that I'm going to walk around with a microphone so that the folks that are on the webinar can hear the questions that are being asked. So as you raise your hand, I will come over to you with a microphone. So with that, we'll open it for questions. Yeah, Rick, if you could tell us a little bit more about the wildlife diversity in the CMR. Um, Hugo showed the slide of Cow Island, and, and then you had a lot of slides of the, the different birds or the avocets and, and whatnot around his place, you know. Um, I was down at Cow Island a couple of years ago, and a couple of students from the University of Montana were doing research on uh, the spiny soft sail turtles. Mm -hmm. There's quite a story that come out of that. Um, but I guess my question would be, um, what do you think the importance of that wildlife di diversity and I mean, we're talking about everything from herpetology to the birds and everything, how important is that going to play into any future wilderness designation? That's a, that's a really interesting and complex question that I'd I'm not going to be able to fully answer it tonight, but I can get to a piece of it. And I think the best I can do is to use an example of one of the early preeminent ecologists in the United States, uh, co-founder of the Ecological Society of America in 1919, I believe, and actually the author of the very first book on managing wildlife as a science, a gentleman by the name of Aldo Leopold, also became, as Bob Marshall called him, the commanding general of the wilderness movement. And so Aldo Leopold recognized a very strong connection between maintaining native biodiversity on a landscape and wilderness protection. That's not to say it's not without challenges. Take endangered species, for example. And when it comes to the habitat manipulation and restoration and augmentation that we need to do with such species as the greater sage grouse, all the work we've done with and are continuing to do with black-footed ferrets, some of that can be intensely manipulative and invasive. And there are some folks who are very strong protectors of wild wilderness would argue that that level of intrusion and manipulation of wildlife species in wilderness is inappropriate. And so it's, we're going to have to have engaged in a lot of thoughtful discourse as we go forward in determining what is the right prescription to allow us to save our native biodiversity on the landscape while still protect it. And if we allow the two to become divisive into camps, a wild camp and a natural camp, we will ultimately lose on both. Sort of a related question, I guess, and maybe for Rick and Hugo both. Um, what sort of changes are you seeing on the prairie, uh, given what's happening with climate change, and what sort of things are you expecting? And maybe Rick, as a manager, getting to this sort of issue of trying to maintain certain plants or animals on the landscape, but the everything else is changing. How do you handle that? I'll go first, and George have I, and I have had a number of really interesting conversations over the last decade and a half or so uh, regarding that, that very issue. It, it's my sense that wilderness is, again, of the people, by the people, for the people, and the purposes of wilderness is ultimately to serve the needs of society. And it's got to be a desirable landscape. And to that end, for me, as an ecologist managing wilderness areas, it would be totally inappropriate and unacceptable to allow invasive species to come into wilderness areas like yellow star thistle, for instance. 
to come down the Missouri River and establish a foothold and invade campsites and people were in places where people enjoy recreating. My sense is that you know invasive species need to be controlled. Not all of them, not everywhere. Some of them are quite benign. And we have to learn to differentiate between those species which might be technically alien to the ecosystem and invasive, but are not likely to cause any great impacts to the ecosystem, like timothy, like clover, like dandelion. You, you can le learn to love those, but you don't need to spend a lot of time and effort trying to rid them from a wilderness ecosystem. But there are others. In the east, like Alanthus altissima, there are disease organisms, there are insects like hemlock woolly adelgid that I believe we have a responsibility. I believe as a manager, I have a responsibility to make the determination of which of those organisms are gonna turn the ecosystem upside down and do my best to deal with them, preferably before they get into wilderness so that I could do my intrusive manipulation outside the wilderness boundary. But I believe that it's my role to keep the native biodiversity as intact as possible in wilderness landscapes. Uh, I, I agree with Rick completely. Uh, several things is that we at one time were encouraged to plant Russian olives. <laughs> and so we planted Russian olive all over the goddamn prairies. <laughs> now it's a noxious weed, and we are eliminating them. And like on Arrow Creek, where I live, which flows into the Upper Missouri Breaks National Monument just about 10, 15 miles away, we've pretty well done that. Uh, but your other question was just climate change itself. What have we noticed, my wife and I? Uh, the birds migrate in two weeks earlier. They, we leave two weeks later. Uh, storms are more violent sometimes. Uh, we found now that because of the warmer weather, we've had things that hit our cows that were not there before, like pink eye. Our cows have never had pink eye until this last year. And they were there until we got a hard frost that got rid of the gnats. The same thing was true with blue tongue in deer. So there is great impacts on that. Coming back to the noxious weeds, uh, it's a struggle. And it's especially a struggle near waterways. In the uplands, we can get handles on that, and we do. And, and in our case, gumbo soil is not real kind to some of the noxious weeds. We find that it's not invasive up in the tough, you know, in the dry clay country. But we do fight it along the creek, you know, like knapweed. Uh, I can think of another hundred or so, but it's here, and I agree we need to fight it on the outside, you know, before it gets into those really isolated areas. And by the way, in my area, most of the knapweed came from Missoula. <laughs> A very true story. They brought riprap for the railroad going down Arrow Creek from Missoula. And what was Missoula famous for but knapweed? And that's exactly where the, it comes. So uh, <laughs> hate to tell you that. Uh, but climate change, I, 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 I'm a firm believer in climate change. It is here. I think Rick would vouch the same thing. Migrations are earlier and later. Okay. The other thing that I'd like to come back to for just one second is one of the things that we've done to bring the habitat back is I think what I tried to illustrate what we did on Arrow Creek, just leaving the beaver alone, seeing what would happen. Now, I needed, I didn't get to stress something. Arrow Creek is a Badlands Creek, so it has flash floods through it. So beaver aren't there always. They get washed out and then come back. They're sort of a temporary creature. And that has a very positive impact on what they do down there. But I think what my wife and I have learned is more and more to take a look at what occurs naturally and see how that enhances. We have a question from a webinar participant. Um, are all the wilderness proposals on federal land, or are you considering acquiring areas that are owned by the state privately or by tribes? I believe this was probably for um, Cameron. 
we are not typically involved with land acquisitions. Uh, most federal public or wilderness legislation involves already existing public lands. There are tribal wildernesses that do exist. Uh, it's typically not a federally acquired type of wilderness, but there's a tribal wilderness in western Montana that many of you are probably familiar with. And so um, I guess that would be my answer is that tribal wilderness would not be a federal acquisition. It would be considered tribal wilderness and mostly work on federally or existing federal lands. Uh, Rick and I have talked about this a little bit. Oh, last week I think got together. And one of the things we both stressed was the need to take our public lands and our private lands and work cooperatively together with them. Our ranch is a good example of which half of it basically on the, on the place that we live is private and half of it is public. And we try to b treat it the same. Now our private lands are farmed to a large extent. There's a lot of grazing on it too, but some of it is where our crop is at. But we try to work it together so that we're blending this together and we're not harming each other. And in fact, we're benefiting each other. And I, Rick can comment on that, but we were talking about that last week. Yeah, we, anyone who was out there in the spring of 2011 after that uh, terrible winter, uh, very deep snows, persistent snows, followed by flooding, and you, you saw the pronghorn migration come out of the High Line and out of southern Alberta and Saskatchewan and come down across the breaks and across the Missouri River and south all the way to the Yellowstone River and then they attempted to get back again in the spring and many of them kegged up on the south shore of Fort Peck Lake, couldn't get across and ended up drowning or starving by the thousands. So it's a very interconnected landscape and it's a that needs to be managed in a cooperative fashion in order to be successful for those species that need to move across it on a on a fairly regular basis. Um, and the, the more agreement we can reach with our neighbors, the better off it will be for the many wildlife species who travel across that, that area. Could I add just one just one little one little point to that? There is a great effort out of the prairies taking place for fencing and fencing to address this issue. And my wife and I, as an example, the type of fence we put in are basically what we call wildlife friendly, as, as friendly as possible, to allow for the free movement of wildlife while keeping cattle or other creatures we want to contain. And that's what needs to be done out there. And it's, there's a lot of bad fences, but there is a lot of programs out there now to improve them. Okay, I'll take one more question from in the back and then we'll have to close it for the evening, but folks can maybe come up afterwards and talk to our guests. Can you um, speak to the issue of bison or the lack of bison on the prairie, particularly in eastern Montana? I'd like to hear maybe a little bit of perspective from, from all three of you, because I'm sure you might have a slightly different perspective on, on bison in particular. Uh, yeah, Rick and I have talked about this too. <laughs> And uh, bison are, are, are unique. They're going to, I mean, first of all, the idea of free roaming bison, there will be no such thing. There will be a limit somewhere. Okay, whether we like it or not, there's going to be a place we don't allow bison. There are places we don't allow grizzly bears. We actually have programs in place that we say we're not going to allow wolves beyond this point. You know, and we especially do this around urban areas. And, and this is true with bison. Now, can we, are we going to be able to create areas that will have free-ranging bison to that limited degree that they'll have a place to wander in? And Rick thinks that there will be. I can see the possibility. Uh, but it's something that has not been worked out at this time. But bison wander different than elk. One last thought. The last spread of brucellosis in cattle was not from bison, it's been from elk.
as a federal agency created by Congress to conserve, protect, and where feasible, restore native species to their natural habitat. We stand ready, willing, and able to restore bison as wildlife following the lead, but, but recognizing that the Montana State Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has lead jurisdiction over that, over that species. So we've stated in our comprehensive conservation plan that if and when Montana FWP decides they want to restore a number of bison in an area somewhere in Montana to be managed as a wildlife species, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will cooperate with them to help ensure the success of that effort. Now let me take off my Fish and Wildlife Service badge for a minute <laughs> and put my hat on as an American who feels cheated because I never got to see a passenger pigeon. I feel cheated because I never got to see an ivory-billed woodpecker. You should feel cheated that you've never seen bison as wildlife on the prairies of Montana. <laughs> he, he is right. It is, uh, they are quite domesticated at this point. If you've ever seen him, you can pretty much walk right up to him. And not, I'm not encouraging you to. Definitely don't do that. <laughs> but compared to uh, the past, yes. I guess I would see our, the biggest challenge is that there's a lot of mistrust by uh, local, the locals in, the, in that part of the state. You'll see signs that say, don't buffalo me uh, a lot of, or in that part of the state. There's bumper stickers and everything. It really comes down to mistrust. Um, it, it's sometimes those efforts to create opportunities for bison are seen as federal land grabs. Um, there's one project I'm sure many of you know about right, already is the American Prairie Reserve. Um, we primarily in this organization work on federal lands, and so I guess our role in that would essentially be providing landscapes that those wildlife could f roam free as well, I guess. So and, and if it came down to it, I, I suppose we would end up being supportive of the efforts of the BLM or what Rick is doing to restore those types of habitats. <laughs> 